everyone. Um, good evening and welcome to our Regicon panel tonight discussing Gatsby in celebration of LGBTQ plus history month. Um, this is our, I think, second Regicon panel for the fall semester, but um, never fear. There are, there are so many more to come that you'll be able to check out. Uh, my name is Jana Albrecht. I'm the Associate Vice President for Enrollment Management here at Illinois State University. Uh, before we begin the the, the panel tonight, I just have a few details to keep all of this running smoothly um, for you in the audience and, and for our panel members as well. Uh, first, we do record the session and it will get posted to the Regicon website. Uh, second, um, some of you in the audience will need confirmation of attendance. Uh, we'll post a link to that. Um, it'll be a form and it, it will be towards the end of the panel so you can complete that so you get credit for um, your class section. And then third, and maybe the most important, these presenters, they, their video and their audio will be on, but they can't hear you um, or see you as guests. So that said, we constantly monitor that Q&A function, and we do encourage you to ask those, those questions of the presenters when you have them. It's really one of their favorite parts of the whole panel, so please, you know, ask the ask the questions um, soon and often. And just so you know, they may not get to it right away, uh, but they will answer all, all of the questions that you might have. And so last uh, is that there are more Regicon sessions to come. So please you know, check our website early and often, and you can even uh, review some of our, our previous panels out there. there. There's some really great stuff. Um, so enough of the housekeeping at this time, I am pleased to introduce our fearless leader, Dr. Scott Jordan. Dr. Jordan, Jordan is the uh, chair of psychology here at ISU, and he also happens to be a moderator and a panelist for tonight's section. So Scott, please take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Albrecht, and welcome everyone to Regicon, the con that asked the question, hey, what's your story? I'm Dr. Scott Jordan, aka Zombie Scotty, cognitive scientist philosopher here at Illinois State University. And tonight we've come together to cel celebrate LGBTQ History Month with a discussion of Gatsby, Jeremy Holtz and Felipe Cunha's graphic novel, novel adaptation of F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic, The Great Gatsby. Joining me on tonight's panel is that motley crew of comic and pop culture aficionados, purveyors of all things geekdom, the Regicon crew. First, the harding work, hardest working man in comics, Mr. Victor Dandridge Jr. Victor, please tell the audience a little something about who you are. Hello, hello. I'm Victor Dandridge, lovingly called the hardest working man in comics. I am a phenomenological narratologist, uh, self-publishing comic creator and, and writer and maker of all the fun things uh, that we haven't talked about on this show yet, but we will one day. I promise you. There you go. Uh, also on the Regicon crew, the queen of all things geekdom, geekdom Dr. Vanessa Hintz. Vanessa, please tell the audience a little something about who you are and what you do. Thank you, Scott. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Vanessa Hintz. I use she, her pronouns. I am a clinical psychologist just west of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in a town called Waukesha. Um, in addition to that, I am an assistant clinical professor at Carroll University here in Waukesha and also a diversity, equity, and inclusion professional and a podcast host. Welcome. Fantastic. Fantastic. Great podcast, by the way, mm, about that. Check it out. Also on the Regicon crew, my colleague and partner in crime in all things nerdy, Dr. Eric Wesselman. Eric, please tell the audience a little something about who you are and what you do. So I'm a, a professor at uh, Illinois State University, um, a social psychologist by training, lover of all things nerdy, and I love to connect them whenever I can and uh, nerd out with uh, like-minded folks. Fantastic. And now it's my extreme pleasure to introduce tonight's guest panelists. Coming to Regicon from the doctoral program in school psychology here at Illinois State University, Ms. Fadia Osman. Fadia, please come into the Regicon room. Tell us, the audience, a little something about who you are, what you do, and why you love comics. Um, hello. I am a third year in the doctoral program in psychology. Um, I um, as not only as a student, but mostly as a nerd, a geek, um, and enjoy uh, comics throughout my entire life, as well as with this specific panel, um, as a lover of literature as well. So excited to be here. Fantastic. We're so glad you're here with us tonight. Uh, you joined us last year for LGBT Eclipse History Month when we discussed the magic fish. So glad you're here. 
And now I'm thrilled to introduce the author and illustrator of Gatsby, Jeremy Holt and Felipe Cuna. Jeremy and Felipe, please come into the Regicon room, introduce yourselves and tell us a little something about who you are and what you do. And we'll start with Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy Holt, uh, pronouns they, them. Um, I am the writer and co-creator of Gatsby the Graphic Novel. Um, I've been writing comic books for 17 plus years. Um, and I just, around that time, fell in love with storytelling and I can't seem to stop doing it. Well, we're absolutely thrilled to have you here and can't wait to talk about this fantastic adaptation of The Great Gatsby. Felipe. Hey, everyone. My name is Felipe. I am from Brazil. I am the artist, along with Jeremy. We we worked on the adaptation of Gatsby. And I've been a comic book artist for, I think, professionally about 10 years. But it's something that I've been doing my whole life. And it's a pleasure to be here. Oh, fantastic. Glad to hear it. So before we start talking about this amazing piece of work, the first thing we have to do is thank those who do all that work that make us look like we know what we're doing. First, I want to thank Dr. Jana Albrecht. You've already met her. Um, I want to thank Mr. Sean Thornton, who does all of the graphic work for Regicon. Ms. Danny Schroeder works in the um, university marketing office, and she's very important to what we do. Ms. Summer Simmons, behind the scenes, checking who's coming into the room, keeping track of students that uh, are here. Ms. Kelly Harmon, lead staff in Department of Psychology. Uh, she's the one who reaches out to everyone to make sure they have what they need. And Ms. Julie Manay Perez, um, who also works in university marketing, is joining uh, the Regicom project as we go further. So what we do here at Regicon is we have this amazing graphic novel. And what I've asked the panelists to do is to pick their favorite frame. What they do then is we display that frame. They tell us why it's their favorite. And then we all gush about that for about three or four minutes. And then we go on to the next person in their favorite frame. So with uh, the Regicon crew plus Faria, that's about five of us. That'll We'll see how far we get in that. And of course, we're willing to take audience questions at any point. And as I like to tell my students in class, the more you ask questions, the more you own what you hear. So please feel free to write in at any time. And now I'm going to share the screen so I can pick our first image for the evening. And I want to say that this, um, whose is this? Who picked this one? Is that yours, Eric? No. no it's Vanessa's. Is it mine? Oh, this is mine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't <laughs> yes, put the is. name down. Okay, go ahead. Please, it's Vanessa. It. Okay. So the thing that resonated with me the most about this frame was the conversation about reinvention and representation. I might have screamed when I read this because it literally was like a mind blown moment, right? So first and foremost, as a Black woman, the, when I turned the page and it was revealed that Gatsby was a black person, I, it just, it warmed my heart. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot express, like words cannot express, like how often do we see like black people in the 1% represented, right? So thank you for that. Um, and I think it was referenced a little bit before this, I think in this, this same conversation, but pages before, um, when Gatsby was talking to Lou, like, yeah, I'm black. And I was like, dang, how many times have I had to have that conversation with someone? Um, but I think I almost selected the the frame or the page a couple before this where they were walking through where the mer people were because that was just amazing. Mm -hmm. And I love the little mermaid and I was like very excited. But nonetheless, <laughs> this page and this conversation, um, the the phrase representation and reinvention are two sides of the same coin. I sat with that for days, for days. Um, and this conversation that they're having, particularly to see a black man who has reached these heights, a black gay man who has reached these heights, right? And the conversation that he's having about ostensibly, I had to reinvent what it means to be a black gay man to reach this level where I can be representative of people in this space. And again, like that, even talking about it now, like I'm getting goosebumps because I think that I have heard throughout my life, like we have to be it, like people have to see it so that they can be it. And I think that this was just a beautiful, creative, amazing representation of that with so many different layers of intersectionality. Like 
It absolutely is beautiful. And again, I'm still sitting with this and I think I want to put this quote on my wall actually. So yeah. thank you. Thank you very, very much for this representation and for that dialogue as well. So Jeremy and uh, Felipe, if you'd like to comment first, go ahead. And then I know the other members of the panel might want something to say as well. Sure. Uh, first of all, speechless. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the word that you use, intersectionality, is something that I thought a lot about when I was wanting to work on this book um, and adapt it. Um, and for me, um, the two themes that came up for me when I first read the book in 2017 was the idea of reinvention and uh, the American dream. So the first part was something that reminded me of advice my mother gave me. And it's kind of nice how the book starts where, you know, Caraway is talking about advice his father gave him. And uh, growing up overseas, I spent half my life living in five different countries because of my dad's job. And my mom would always say, this is the time to reinvent yourself. And I never really did take her up on that because I didn't have the courage or the confidence. But looking back now, I realized that <clears throat> there is a power to it. And that is something that I saw throughout this book, um, both what I wanted to do with it and what Fitzgerald had done with it. And then the idea of the American dream is something I think about a lot as a uh, queer Asian person that, uh, you know, what is the American dream to me? Not what it was 100 years ago, not what it was 20 years ago, what it is to me right now. And yeah, so it was a culmination of those things. Billy Bay, did you want to say something? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I had the, the very difficult job to do justice to that very pivotal moment because it's it's a very long conversation between the two where very important um, things are are discussed and i needed to make sure that there was um there was visual elements to sort of embrace that sort sort of um make it the uh, make it make it justice i think that's the the the, the correct term so I looked for stuff that I that would look kind of magical, kind of mm -hmm. um, it's very real. It's very real. It's the real world. It's very modern. It's very um, current. But at the same time, I wanted to bring something else because it's kind of what it is. It's something that it needed to it needed to be elevated that way. So I hope I hope the the I I, I could achieve that. That's that's my. That was my that was my goal. I think that that's it. And if I could just say one one additional thing, use the term magic, and I think the the word magic is used here too in a clinical sense. Like magical thinking is often thought of as like a cognitive distortion, whereas in yeah. this case, I would argue what this message is is that we have to be magical to get <laughs> outside of this mold, this box that societal expectations place on us, right? So you mentioned too, Jeremy, about the um, American dream and what that means for you, right? And I think that when working with marginalized folks in therapy, we're always talking about sort of like going beyond and empowering them to go beyond societal expectations. And what is that? That's magic. That's not what's expected of you. That's magic. And so I appreciate that you use that word, not only here, but even in your description. So thank you. I think you did a fantastic job of illustrating um, the idea of potentialities and alternative realities uh, with the fountain in the middle. It's the very center of the page. And the beautiful thing about that kind of image, be it water, be it whatever it is, is it's unstructured. It's unformed. It's fluid. No pun intended. But that captures the idea of potentiality. And it's in that potentiality that new things can come. And one thing I love about the way potentialities deal dealt with in this story is it's not always pleasant. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of pain in the change. And I think being honest to that pain is something we don't quite often hear. And so I appreciate the, the artistry there as well as the commitment to the realities of um, the ability to change and then the costs of doing the work to change. Anyone else? I, I got to jump in on the 
sort of yin and yang context of uh the two characters Gatsby um and and I just totally lost the cousin's name what is the cousin's name why did I just lose that uh, Lou. thank you um as they are talking about this space of accomplishment um where Gatsby is acknowledging that he started off on a lower tier and had to uh achieve something there is a uh, sort of this juxtaposition of greatness but also um detriment that is almost inherent in the in the richness that he has we've had conversations previously when we're talking about black panther the movie and how as uplifting as that is um for for black audiences in general there are aspects of it that have an inherent negative of misogyny and things like that that are so beautifully interwoven into it that it's truly authentic so where as gatsby is this wonderful as as vanessa pointed out wonderful representation of of success in a black individual there are things that Gatsby does later on that become, ooh, that's questionable, sticky, icky. Why did you do that? And there is this this beautiful mirror of greatness and 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 uh, darkness all at the same time in his presence. There's such wonderful um, just kind of mix of of humanity because that's the truth of all of us. We are both good and bad given the situation, given context, um, you know, we come into this thing admiring everything about him until we find out why he went, you know, this way. And then there's people that could be like, how dare you? But again, this is, yeah. this is the context of chasing the American dream, achieving the American dream and what you're willing to do to do it. That is that undercurrent that we don't like to talk about when it comes to the American dream. And by having that, you know, recognized and symbolized within a black character where so much of, of American history and wealth was built on the back of blacks, like it is, it is contextually rich. And if you didn't get that from reading it, I hope you get it when you reread it because it's right there. If I may jump off uh what what victor said to this idea of the complexity of gatsby and um i i do some some research on uh media representation and lack of as a form of systemic inclusion or exclusion and one of the the things that i've been sort of looking at at the conversations among representation is having folks from identity categories wanting to be fully like one phrase i saw was being fully and completely represented right so there's you know a lot of discussion about being represented negatively but being represented in a two-dimensional positive space also has its pitfalls right uh and and so that this this push towards having people being people in all of their wonderful complexity and messiness uh it just re really struck me with what what victor said i also wanted oh, yeah. to just quickly oh sorry no Fradio, please go ahead no okay um just to go back to what you said felipe about like having the the gift and opportunity and challenge to bring weight to and being able to display this specific conversation and this theme of reinvention and American dream being the reason why Gatsby is a timeless story and it does transcend the time of doesn't exist in the 1920s and can exist uh in now and today in the ways that the two of you have been able to implement that and just thinking about specifically the story overall, but that specific panel and that specific conversation highlighting the like amount of skill it took for both of you to work together to create such a narrative piece of text and thinking about adaptation and being able to then put that on page um, and represent it both with how the conversation go um, and what the characters say, also what the character, what it looks like on page. So just like, I think that scene and specifically the magic of it, as well as the magic of what is the magical thinking that they are talking about, do both come across very well. Just wanting to highlight that. And also like, even though you said it's a challenge, it's something I feel like you've knocked it out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And it's also just beautifully, brutally honest. In other words, people who reach those levels, there are things they do to the world to make those levels possible. And that's part and parcel to the phenomenon we call America. So the courage to tell this alternative narrative, yet at the same time, let American being express itself um, is, is bold. So I, I very much appreciate that that uh, that boldness. You guys, we got a Reggie count first. I already got questions. Oh. I already got questions. They're re relative to what we're talking about. So, guys, Let's I'm go. just going to 
bring them out now. So before I answer these or ask, tell you guys these questions, I got to let you know, I'm currently teaching a class called other land, where we read graphic novels as a way to look at the phenomenon of othering. Um, we all know what the meaning of othering is in sort of social context. I try to take it to the perceptual cognitive level. All perceptions are otherings, all thoughts are otherings, blah, 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 blah. And I have students read the book and then I invite them to come to this and ask questions about othering. And that's what they're doing. So do you think the idea of reinvention and representation being on two sides of the same coin aligns with the idea of othering in wild systems theory, which is we're not going to talk about what wild systems is, but it's the background for the course. In our class, it's been said before that othering is a new way to look at look towards diversity and inclusion. And I'm curious about how you think this aligns with that idea and this graphic novel. So the issue is, do we see do we see issues of othering going on um, in this graphic novel? I'll throw that out to everyone and uh, we'll see where it goes. I feel like it's not fair if I answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 please go ahead. And then I saw that Jeremy was about to launch a launch a response. So Victor, go first and then we'll go ahead. Yeah, Jeremy. go ahead, Victor. Well, yes. So othering clearly is there, even in the phrasing um, from the text itself that, uh, you know, representation is is the other side of the coin. So when you're already stating that there is a coin with two sides, you have already othered the two concepts of reinvention and representation by saying that they are both separate things, although they are connected. Um, it's it's right there. And it's so wonderful um, in the example of wild systems theory of how even though those things are separate ideas, they do function together and almost need each other to yeah. be a functional piece. Um, and and it's it's such a wonderful showcase of that concept in practice. I have to say that the, the in-depthness that you all are discussing, Felipe, and my work uh, makes me feel smarter than I actually am, uh, because I, I did think about a lot of things for this, but I do enjoy that you're picking up things that I think I was thinking about sort of in the back of my mind, and it sort of came through, whether it was an art direction to Felipe or whether it was a, you know, just a what might have seemed like a minor thing. I mean... The truth is for me, I am a Korean adoptee. I'm also an identical triplet. So it's rare to not only be an adoptee, but to grow up with biological siblings. Um, and I grew up with other uh, siblings that um, are white. And so, you know, this idea of um, reinvention and um, just trying to understand representation has been really challenging for me in the past, let's say three or four years, because I've really leaned into these things that I ignored. and. Gatsby came to me in this time in my life where I had been writing for maybe like eight years, these essentially white male savior stories that I thought were my narrative. And it wasn't until I started looking at these things and I realized I was writing for an audience, I was writing for an editor, and that these things didn't represent my experiences. So when I decided to overhaul everything I was developing and working on, I decided to just speak more authentically. And I think for me, this book encapsulates, I think, the advice that everybody gets as a writer is write what you know. And I never like that advice because it assumes that what I know is interesting and I've never assumed that. Mm -hmm. And so through lots of therapy and just self-reflection and self-discovery, I've come to retool that advice to be write what you've survived. Mm -hmm. And I think about my own traumas, I think about whether they're external or internal. And Gatsby is a survivor in at, at his core, and he's had to basically break a system and redesign it for himself um, so he can basically go as far as he wants to go with it. Um, and there is, you know, consequence to that. But, um, yeah, so I do. I, I appreciate the in-depth thoughts behind um, these panels and, and the story at, at, at large. And, Jeremy, you need to copyright the phrase write what you've survived all right that yeah, needs to be yeah. somewhere in print with your name next to it because that that's a really <laughs> really good one so here's what we're going to do we got four more frames to potentially get through so we have another question from henny yeager uh, and um aqua baby 62 what i'm going to do at the moment is save those questions because i do want to get to these other frames so please hannah and aqua baby wait and we will get to your image i promise so let me go to the next one. All right, I think this one is Victor's. 
Uh-oh. Yeah. Yeah, you should have saved mine for last. We're about to get deep. <laughs> <laughs> Is that yours? Yep, that's mine. Okay. That's mine. Um, so the reason why I chose this one, uh, is it's super important to where I feel the context of this adaptation actually goes. Um, I was first inspired earlier in the book, um, where, uh, Lou first sees the Mer people and he's, he's hanging out with Alexis and they ask this question of whether or not, um, they have views on, on gender and Lou says, never thought of it before. And, and Alexis responds, well, I think you have now. And so here we are later on, far later in the book, where they've actually had an intimacy that's been built up. And Alexis finally asked the question of how do you, you know, identify? How do you see yourself? And ultimately what this was for me was this beautiful showcase of societal growth and and progress i'm a big fan of, of star trek um believing that the universal idea of where we need to go in the future is united and in a space of of actual uh discovery if not uh internal self realization and i feel like the existence um if not the proliferation of people finding themselves via either their gender identity or their sexual orientation is a statement that we are fast tracking towards that progressive space where what our existence isn't anymore is a mortal toil that's built on a biological system of we have to repopulate just for the sake of continuation what we are allowed to be now and moving fast forward into is a space where we're allowed to be who we want to be and that is our truth that is the necessity of our goal it is the true encapsulation of the american dream where that's where we're ultimately reaching for and this context of what gaxby the story kind of uh, brings to me for that with with lou as the regard here though we've seen gatsby be this person that has done so lou is a person that um kind of becomes this transient um individual that goes from this space where they were not given the opportunity previously to even consider gender or sexuality. There was almost a framework that they lived their lives that they were supposed to live. And once moved into a space of, of we'll argue opulence, but I say progress, where they could then choose what they wanted to be, who they wanted to be, how they wanted to be. And that was the truth that they had the entire time and they were never allowed to really indulge in that before. So that panel really like signifies to me this embrace of tomorrow looking at where the future could go and seeing how you know in the sense of um identity being such a self-reflective uh piece of the puzzle and being allowed to do so is a huge accomplishment of us as a species us as a society we've gotten to a place where instead of having to toil for the sake of the society we get to envision and embody ourselves as ourselves as we wish us to be fantastic I um I what I love about these Regicon panels is someone drops a mic like that. And as I listen, <laughs> I sort of inspired to say other things that take me back to the first question about othering here. Because all of the concepts that are put in this frame, oh, are you this? Are you that? I could be this, I could be that. All of those come from the world we live in. You know, no one in the frame says, I'm a I'm a Venetian, right? I'm a Martian. And what that means is that all of these identity categories that we use are actually necessary in the sense that we have to fit ourselves into the space of the people we live in. And we manage our relationships with each other in relation to these concepts. So the concept pansexual emerges contextually over time in relation to other forms of sexual, bisexual, etc. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that um, this simultaneously talks about freedom to express while simultaneously acknowledging the sort of contextually bound nature where the, of where that freedom comes from. Mm -hmm. So we are bound up with each other all the time. Our identities are always emerging out of our interactions with all of us. And we have to have those identity boundaries to be someone. Uh, we don't like to talk about boundaries. And um, I think that's too bad to be honest, because uh, I, I think we, we, we just do disservice to how hard we have to work to be someone. And that's just constant daily work, dress, talk, hair, all of it is part of being someone. And so I appreciate the way that this frame 
speaks to freedom while simultaneously acknowledging the sort of contextually constrained ways that we come about it. Um, I just love it. Yeah, it, it really, to me, a lot of these scenes regarding gender identity were scenes that I sort of wish had happened for me regarding my own journey with it. Um, mm. I think back in 2017, when I came out as non-binary, um, I refer to it as like a baby queer mistake where I felt I had to tell my family. I felt that I, I owed it to them to some degree. And reality was they held an intervention and basically were not curious, um, got defensive. And, you know, for this book, it's like I wanted to show characters talking in a way that I know people can speak. And as, you know, uh, what was just mentioned uh, a bit ago about, um, you know, who we are and, and what our identity is, it's, it is a freedom. And it's holding that space to live your truth. And, and I don't think it's radical. I think it's just being more gentle overall. Anyone else? The only thing I would add, I think, from a clinical perspective, as always, is I think, um, again, that sort of both anding that we're doing right now, understanding that you, what, like what you said, Victor, and what you just referenced, Jeremy, you have the power at all times to live in your truth. And because of societal constraints, that's more difficult for certain people and, and for people who are identify in a certain way. And so I think part of, again, what happens in therapy, particularly when we're doing work around identity and, and living in your truth, is how can we both end this? Because I don't want to tell somebody a lie, like you can go out and no one's going to bother you and it's going to be sunshine and rainbows when you come out or when you do it, because it's not like that for everyone. And so how can we simultaneously uplift people? And you absolutely, I don't like this language, but should be able to do and be anything that you want to be and we know it ain't like that for all people right and so i think that this sort of um again this both ending i think is sometimes difficult particularly when we're talking about people just wanting to be who they are authentically we're not talking about behaviors we're not talking we're talking about identity which is so salient to who we are and it's so valuable to who we are and so i think that that when i talk to people in, in dei type of trainings this is why inclusion is necessary. Like you said, Jeremy, it's not radical, it's human. It's empathy, right? And I think that that is, I was just having a conversation the other day about this, right? But I think that that both and is important when we are also in spaces talking about how we can be more inclusive. Like we can both honor and uplift and understand societal constraints. But I think as a society, we don't know how to both and very well. Right. I think now that here, is Regicon. That's what we do. It's, absolutely. <laughs> but no, like to that point, even I think the, the biggest issue that like, not that I'm like solving the world right now, but we haven't figured out how to be contingent, contingently othered, right? Where your difference is your difference, but it does not change mine. Like that's yeah. the problem that we've not um, globally embraced. Whereas, I mean, we see that on, on international levels, um, nationalistic ideas, um, various different contexts where who you are is fine. As long as I don't look at that or perceive that as a threat to who I am, the moment that we can actually cohesively have that othering sense of not necessarily having to homogenize, but literally just coexist, we'll mm. always will be in the Star Trek framework. We'll be we'll be there. Well said. You know, one of the one I don't want to use the word failures, challenges of American history is not embracing diversity as our greatest strength mm -hmm. um and you know i look at western european cultures that have a more socialist framework and even though they have federal health care even though they have federal education that also tends to be fairly ethnically based in those cultures right and so it seems as though that was our challenge is how do we stay together as different ethnic groups and love and respect each other and thrive in difference as opposed to collapsing into, you know, smaller groups that are feel like things are scarce. And so that's that's just been one of my things for the past couple of years is let's become what we could be. And that means everybody becoming who they can be. And um, I now 
Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. I think that's the challenge, to be honest, that if we could move through a lot of the financial issues we feel are facing, these, this culture wouldn't be financial issues anymore. I will just want to add, if you could throw the image back up, um, oh, yes. something Hold that on, just got me go. thinking. Yeah. Um, it's just regarding a shorthand that Felipe and I developed over time. And there's something I love about the camera angle that he chose here because, and just the way he's drawn this bed. I mean, I did provide references, but I wanted the moment to feel intimate. I wanted to feel safe, but I wanted to feel comfortable. And so mm. when I look at this, space it's like i can almost feel the thousand thread count sheets and like <laughs> the aromatherapy candles in the background and it's just you know i i really do appreciate that you know philip a chose an angle where it's just these two people sort of cocooned in a way when you are in love and you're talking to that person that sees you for who you are you just feel like it's you two that exist and, no, and nothing else okay now it's time for a sort of behind the scenes question uh, how many times did Felipe redo this issue, this this image? <laughs> redo? I... Yeah, I know. Draw it once and then talk to Jeremy, maybe go back and edit a bit. Oh, no. Fortunately, the the process was very streamlined. Right? There, there wasn't a lot of... I'm very grateful to Jeremy for their um, trust in my abilities and the, the vision that I tried to bring. Fantastic. Because it made me comfortable to try these things out. I yeah. I'm really glad. I'm I'm really happy to hear their description of the scene of the um, how it is um, how it, how it, how it works for that moment. The intimacy, the the background, and all that. It's something that it was intentional, but I think it came more naturally, and I think it becomes clear when someone else um analyzes it because i think i think the the, the work the work is in our work the work is the, the readers the readers mm -hmm. will take it will embrace it will have different readings from it and that's when you sort of realize what you've done because for me it might have been something more natural i i i thought about the intimacy i thought about the 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 composition i wanted to work that but it wasn't that um, specific in my mind. It wasn't, I, I want to do this and that and the other. It was something that it just worked. And mm -hmm. to see that be recognized makes me feel like my work worked. <laughs> that's that's the <laughs> thing. I, and, I, and I'm really happy that it, that, it, that, that that gets seen, you know. No, that's it's fantastic. Way. Definitely. I think like one piece of that you mentioned, like the work is for the reader for it to interpret. And also going back to Jeremy's point when they were saying, listening to us talk about this yeah. uh, and your work together and like you're making it seem like you're smarter than you are. <laughs> uh, but also like this is the an adaptation of a work. You are a reader of that work in the context of what you and your experiences uh, and putting that to the page as a reader and then as a creator and then for us to read. So we're seeing that process filtered through you of the original yep. uh, work. So it's also, it's all part of that. <laughs> if I could just follow up on Faria's comment there, um, the the expertise is something you already had in you when you started writing. Mm -hmm. I mean, being a fan of Gatsby, uh, the great Gatsby, and then being who the both of you are, bringing those expertises together that usually doesn't happen consciously, right? It comes out of you because it's in you and who you are. And the challenge is to get a moment where it can just come out without your conscious mind getting in the way, right? You know what it's like to be working 20 minutes in, you get a phone call and it's like, damn it, now I'm going to have to re, you know, spend the next 20 minutes getting back into the groove. So yeah, it's, it, it, it's a wonderful, beautifully complex reflection of where you've been and what you've done, as you say, right, what you've survived, right? So it definitely yeah. shows up. And Felipe, I got to give you your roses. What you've created here visually is gender neutral. Um, I, I see like bits of um, like Steve Dillon quality, which is very masculine in its presentation. And Becky Cloonan, which is very feminine in his presentation. And it rides the line like right between of great storytelling, great characters that it doesn't 
it doesn't say one way or another um, what your gender identity is in the art itself. It's not harsh lines. It's not super rounded lines. It's this beautiful mix of all those things that just allow the story to be um, what you what you need to experience as you read it. Thank you. Uh, that I'm really glad you say that because it, it is something that I try to be very mindful of because I try to, because there's, there's a lot of background characters too. There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of parties. There's, there, there's a whole universe happening in the background. And uh, I wanted to be as much, um, as mindful as I could about how to populate that world. And I wasn't certain. I, I couldn't know while I was doing it. I, would, I, I can only know now after people read it and digested it saw it and it makes me happy that you that that, that is something that, that caught your eye because it is something that I, that I tried to do and i wasn't sure how much um how, how successful i was in doing that so yeah thank you thank you very much you're welcome you're welcome all righty then um aqua baby threw another question in the mix i'm gonna let you know we are gonna get to your questions so please do not leave we are gonna go to the next frame at the moment and the next frame I want to say is that is mine. Aggie, there you go. So a lot of what Dr. Hintz was saying earlier of that scene later on in the book um, kind of pulls into this piece. And so um, thinking about the representation and the idea of reinvention, um, I, as a person who loved the aspect of The Great Gatsby, as I mentioned before, of it being a timeless story of reinvention. And I think that this book and you guys have done a very stellar job in like contextualizing that in the idea of social media. So this is a one of the like the ways of how we represent ourselves on an mm -hmm. online space. Uh, so there's so many different pieces that I did want to pull from and so many different uh, pictures that I took. I'm like, I don't know which is the piece that I'm going to take. So <laughs> Um, this one, Lou being surprised, like with all due respect, I wasn't expecting that I'd be black. And I think the thing that to speak upon is that Gatsby recognizes and understands where his place in society is as, as another black person, but as a gay black man specifically for him, he recognizes that he does not have the image of power. Um, and I think pulls into the tension and recontextualizes that tension of like the original piece of old money versus new money, and this one being old money versus new money with the tech scheme, but also what does it mean when you are rich and in power when you also have these other marginalized identities? Um, and the awareness that Gatsby has and recognized in that space, and then the power of that personal reinvention and being able to stay in the background and gather that power while in this online space of the app. Um, and once he's put into the forefront, then people are having to think about him and contextualize him and also make, uh, he no longer can be a chameleon because he's in the spotlight. And like, what does that mean when you are put into the spotlight, when you have these conflicting identities where you have some pieces of power, but also you are so marginalized in other pieces of identity and that intersectionality piece. And so I think we've talked a lot about in early, like earlier parts of our conversation, just, just like one of the first pieces of uh, where I noticed it and which is why I like took a picture of this piece. Mm -hmm. um, and it was so lovely to hear and see the immediate recognition of like, it would be Gatsby that bring it up, even though that Lou is like taking a the little dot, dot, dot after I wasn't expecting gives Gatsby a moment to be like, yes, I know what you're thinking. And I've had that moment where we were like, oh, okay, I see who you are. Um, so just echoing previous conversations. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the, the reinvention again, was a huge inspiration for me. And then honestly, using the text as a blueprint, knowing that Gatsby had made money doing something, nobody knew what it was. And then you later find out that he is a bootlegger of sorts. So he's making money, not exactly on the up and up. And so I thought, could Gatsby exist in the 21st century? Mm. And for a while, I didn't write this because I didn't think it was possible. And then when I understood the idea of a digital footprint, and I have a friend from I'd say middle school, high school, who I could not find. 
I spent years looking for this person. And I eventually found him and I realized it, it was possible. So from that, I think that this idea that he makes his money and if it's new money, social media lends itself to reinvention, lends itself to how you want to present to the world. And then the idea of how he actually makes his money. Um, again, I was just taking uh, a cue from Fitzgerald and I didn't want to stray too far because I wanted it to feel like Gatsby. No, absolutely. I think I'm thinking about the like the creator of like Bitcoin is someone who you do not know. And like that is a piece where you do not know how like these people do exist and you can exist in like, yes, honestly, I was like, I am now I'm getting into the weeds, but absolutely. I think <laughs> that it is a story that could be told and you showcase that it could be told in the 21st century in different ways and in that digital space. So And then the phenomenon that the tech that he creates where you can reinvent things on the fly, it just mm -hmm. basically makes us understand that the things we have are forever contextually bound. They they're we can't they're not independent of where we are. So we're struggling and working to be someone here in this space. And then when you can say, oh, but wait a minute. Like, and this VR suit is going to be available in 10 years if it's not already available, right? But I can go in this space and be this. And it's like, well, then why am I there that way? Why am I that there? And it's like, well, because in a sense, we have to be. Not in the sense that we have to be as specific, but the issue is, you mentioned marginalized identities. If people are coming at people with marginalized identities, they have to find a way to survive in that space. And therefore, that means being loud and proud. That's a, that's a form of not just resistance. It's a it's a form of being. You have to be someone, and you have to have that. I'm going to call it a boundary. We can talk about that later if you want. But you have to have that identity boundary to be able to be in that space with everyone. Can Anyone I, else can, on this can, frame? Go ahead. Can I ask a, a? It's a tangent, tangential question completely. Um, is there a reason why you called the app Ouroboros? Um, just the visual of a snake eating its tail, I felt was very apt to what being on social media feels like. Um, yeah. Okay. And if you're not careful, that's what you end up doing. Cause it, it, it creeped me out in the moment because <laughs> I don't know if you guys are caught up on Loki season two, mm. but you're not. Okay. I don't want to spoil <laughs> anything, but we'll say or girl shows up as a character name and the context within oh yeah 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 like it i was like what is happening am i being incepted mm. right now like it is <laughs> it was it was clever it was clever so yeah see it made me think full metal alchemist because mm. the, the homuncule i have the oroboro tattoo mm -hmm. nice mm -hmm. nice any more on that frame okay then i think we'll go on to eric's Okay, so I, I think some of the what I'm going to talk about here, we've already kind of uh, touched on a little bit from previous conversations, but um, let me, I think I can see that. Hold on, let me make the screen bigger so I can read it. Uh, this is where being introduced to the um, new technology, and he, uh, Gatsby says, you know, you can be the real you, free from all societal expectations, and... Uh, empowered solely by your desires and i sat with this sentence for a bit because um the concept of the self right the, who are you uh is one that you know philosophers and psychologists have been wrestling with since their respective fields were established and I, i've recently started delving into this literature for a class that i'm teaching on the psychology of narratives and how our identities influence our connection with stories and in turn then how those stories influence how we think of ourselves um and uh, again, kind of rehashing old ground here, but uh, self-concepts are complex. They're, they're dynamic and they're they're socially emergent. So Gatsby's idea of being a self free from all social expectations and somehow one's own desires being something that is purely one's own, that's asocial, uh, asocial uh, seems to be really strongly rooted in an individualistic cultural worldview, uh, which makes sense for how I read 
Gatsby's character, and indeed most of the main cast. Um, there's research that uh, looks at how folks from uh, collectivistic cultures are more likely than individualistic uh, folks uh, to recognize the socially contextual nature of, of self-concept, how we are always at almost every level connected to other people. Um, and even Gatsby uh, is basing uh, their identity at least from the reinvention quest on social relationships and culture, right? Gatsby wanted Tommy uh, and went on this, this quest of reinvention to reach a certain level of success that was based on their dominant cultural value structure. Right. And so this is one way that I experience the tension between Lou and the other characters. And perhaps one of the reasons why Lou, being from a more collectivistic culture at the end of the story, chooses to take a different path from everyone else. So that's what I got. Comments. I think, yeah. This is one of the ones that I like almost chose as well. Um, and something that I noticed when I was reading back through my old copy of The Great Gatsby that I wrote a lot is the idea of a facade. And so like something of a question to like to bring up is just like, what is the difference between like a virtual self that you're representing with your true self versus a facade and where like that tension piece. And that's where I was also thinking as well. So I'm loving that question. I'll I'll say a couple of things and we'll see where it goes because um, the self, your sense of who you are is an emergent unconscious aspect of what you've done. And I have a saying, identity follows circumstance. In other words, if you want to feel like someone else, be someone else, and you have to do it for a long time so that when you wake up in the morning, that's what you feel like. Because who you feel like is who you've been. So you have to change who you've been for a period of time. And even in that sense, then your sense of who you are is emerging out of your memories, right? And so your memories are constantly, not to go too neuro, but your memories are constantly being flushed into your cortex so that everything you do, think, talk, walk, all of it is an anticipatory edge derived from your memories. So identity is like this identity boundary we have to create. Because if we don't, we can't tell, are we generating our own thoughts? Is someone outside of me generating those thoughts? And people who can't generate those memory boundaries uh, often get diagnosed as schizophrenic because they're generating thoughts, but they can't discriminate that they've created them versus the world put them in there. So these are the kind of things that need me to talk about identity bubbles, identity boundaries. Uh, and so your identity is necessary. And necess my identity is necessarily an othering. I have to other the rest of the world to be someone. You know, usually when we use the word othering, it's it has a negative connotation. And the the challenge then is that we we can't we it, it prevents us from examining how all of us necessarily others simply to be. And then once we have that conversation, then I think we talk about well, why do some people get to other and other people don't? Well, what are the different spaces in which some people get to project their other rings and others don't? And I just think that gets us into a more authentic non-binary space talking about identity and um, talking about the kind of complex nuanced issues we're trying to deal with. So blah, blah, blah. The, 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 the sense of self is always emergent from memory. And the struggle is to change our memories uh, if we want to feel and be someone else. So, yeah. So insightful. I I, I really like all of what you just said. Um, I also appreciate Eric's um, detection of Lou's discomfort with all of this um, because he is just, he doesn't come from this type of culture. And I specifically had him uh come from Singapore because I spent six years there as a child and I have memories of it. And uh, when Crazy Rich Asians came out, that was in a lot of ways very pivotal for me as an Asian person, but it was also sort of not quite getting as far as I wanted to see that type of representation get because then everyone just assumes everyone from Singapore is wealthy, which is not true. And something I've thought a lot about since Crazy Rich Asians is you know, we need to hold space within, I think, media and entertainment specifically, where people of color can just make mediocre things. It's okay. Where they can make really bad well things. Like, you can't well just expect, and, and I've dealt with this where 
I pitch something and it's like, oh, we already have one of those. We have a a, a book about a chef. Why don't you have two books about a chef? Like, <laughs> and so I, I think that you know to expect you know people of color to have to rise to that occasion and it has to be Emmy or Oscar worthy to be noticed is you know we're not as far as we'd like to be. I really like your comment about it. First of all, a rather high percentage of anything in any genre is crap. All right. It's the really good stuff that's rare. And so this idea of letting people ex create, ask, having people create stuff that someone else may claim is not that great. At the same time, consuming that can lead you to be one of the best directors, writers ever. Right. So uh, let all flags fly. Right. Because it's in the letting all those flags fly that I can experience things that I wouldn't if all I were seeing and consuming were the things that someone else judged to be the best. There are, there are ways of being in the world I wouldn't be able to embody or try because uh, they wouldn't be available. So I, I'm completely with you on that. Um, I love B-movies. I grew up on B-movies. I still look for B-movies because um, they're fantastic. And um, yeah. And I would also say to that point, I think that this this idea of sort of the bar being in a different place for people of color, I think is a manifestation of sort of larger societal inequity, right? When people of color and other marginalized folks do something that is not good, is attributed to like an internal, like personal factor, like you are not good versus white people and other people with privilege, it's a situational factor as opposed to dispositional. And we see that across the board, students, professionals, right? And I think that that, allowing space for there to be mediocrity or just okayness i think with people of color well i think and other marginalized folks i think is a way that we start to challenge that inequity um and challenge that idea and i think um scott something you referenced too i wanted to speak to about like othering and um our sort of hesitance to do that i think that is partly because we have conflated difference with value you know what i'm yeah. saying so it's different I have to put it in a hierarchy, like better or worse than yep. me, as opposed to being sort of like different is just different. And so I think, yes. particularly in America, right? When we think about something as other, we automatically ascribe a value to it. Uh, I don't want to say we. Folks all, folks can automatically ascribe a value to it, which I think makes that, you know, people, then, then, then we get into conversations about like, I don't see difference. Everybody is the same, eh? <laughs> which is also problematic, right? And so yes. I think that, a conversation about how we can other without devaluing or ascribing yeah. more value. I think that is the conversation that again is going to move us into a space of equity. And it's not the conversations that we have them at Regicon, but that we're not having largely, right? No, absolutely. Or at least have a a positive framework of value. Yes. Right. Like because okay, this is it's in there. Okay. I was just looking for it. I promise it's in there. But if you look at the idea that Gatsby uh brings about the best version of Tommy, um, and part of that idea of this emphasis of love bringing out the fullest of you, right? Whoever you are. So Alexis to Lou, Lou to Alexis, um, Gatsby to, to Tommy. First of all, when Gatsby first introduced himself, he calls himself Jay, but Tom calls him James. Like that is the full value of his name. He doesn't truncate any part of it. And I want to say that in there, uh, Gatsby calls him Thomas. He doesn't call him Tommy like everybody else does because he elevates to the full value of, of who he is. It's not a matter of truncating him to Tommy, which sounds tri trivial and, and jo juvenile. He's like, no, you're Thomas because that's how I see you. Mm. And that's the, that's the clarity of, of, the positive othering that he gives him. Everybody else can can call you Tommy, and it's not a disrespect, but I'm going to call you Thomas because I'm elevating my position to you and your position to me. I and just want to riff on that with you. But I, um, Venice, I truly appreciate your bringing up this issue of othering and valuing because one of the challenges we the species have lived in forever is uh, there are things to be gained for some folks by valuing the othering of others. And I, we all spontaneously empathize with everyone. If we see someone in pain, we feel their pain unless we've been trained that they're less than human. Mm. And why would we be trained that they're less than human 
We're trained that they're less than human so that we don't empathize with them so that we can continue to exploit them. So when you look at exploitive when you look at exploitive cultures, you'll find that they have a system of dehumanization in place. And it's not just cognitive and verbal, it's infrastructure driven. They are, the world is created in a way that keeps them non-human. And that then prov provides us a way to not have to empathize. And a lot of dramatic moments and a lot of tensions that the novels and stories that recognize this, there's a moment of awakening for the person who's been dehumanizing to suddenly see someone they've been dehumanizing as a human and to recognize, damn, I was doing a lot of work to be that way. It's more work to dehumanize than it is to empathize, mm -hmm. right? So um, that valuing thing is its just too many people making money off of it. And um, that's part of the systemic nature of what the work needs to be done. So look, y'all, I'm going to do my frame here. And I am absolutely delighted that this whole conversation about Lou started and Lou's background in Singapore. And I could tell that there was something being said about Singapore and not being of that group mentioned in that movie, right? So the frame that I picked, plus I picked mine last, everyone else said, I like <laughs> to let people, everyone else pick theirs. But I absolutely love this frame. And the reason I love this frame is because um, Lou is just being who he is, right? Alexa is being who she is. And when he says they're beautiful, she immediately challenges him in an American sort of contemporary way. Are you objectifying them? And he says, I'm sorry, that wasn't my intention. I meant to say that they possess an ethereal beauty. It must feel quite liberating to be one of them, if only for a night. Alexa gives him grace and they move on. I just love this fact that he's in this space and it, there's more than one time in the story where you see what I'm going to call his blue collar values. I, I don't mean to judge you, but I'm a blue collar kid from a factory town in the Midwest and I wasn't born in the upper middle class. And I love seeing characters like that because what they tend to do in these stories is bring levity and grounding. Right. And you're seeing this life of extravagance and ungroundedness and people who have the opportunity to spend the day by the pool drinking like every day. I, I, I just can't imagine that life. <laughs> and I'm not going to say, you know, I go on vacation. You know, I'm not going to say I don't indulge, but um, I that goes on. And it's almost as if you sense the pending blue collar presence. Right. Someone's going to come in and ground this story, man. And I love the way you're referring back to what Eric said, right? He's not just a blue collar contrast. He's also comes from a collectivist, holist culture. Um, I love the line where, you know, he asks about, can I have a bike? And they say, why do you want to buy? Well, I'm going to get a job. Oh, your parents must be very proud. So the people that are saying that to him know the world he comes from, right? And he says, oh, I just don't want to inconvenience them with paying for everything I'm doing. Um while every other character, his age in the story, has everything paid for them by their parents, right? So I just like the way those little nuggets of grounding come in, and they come in through this character, and it just gives the story, well, it just accentuates the grandiosity of, of Gatsby's life and, and the world that they're all living in. And uh, that kind of writing is uh, delightful. So I love the character, Lou. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think because I made the Caraway character not white, I mean, obviously it was deliberate, but when I read the text, you know, Nick does feel like an outsider looking in, but he only is an outsider to a degree because he still has privilege and he's, and he's white. And I thought, wow, if this character is not white, what else can I explore mm -hmm. and discuss with his experience of living this opulent American lifestyle? And you know, I, I thought that it could play on multiple levels, that he's not only othered by the fact that he doesn't come from this this lifestyle, but also it's just a completely different uh, mindset about how family works. Like, you never mm -hmm. see Tommy's parents. Like, his parents are basically not there. Um, and, yeah, so, it, again, by just going through my work and deciding to infuse color literally and figuratively, I was like... Mm -hmm these stories resonate on a completely different level and it was way more interesting and more fun to write. 
going back to Faria's comment about facade, right? His presence just re just diagnoses and clearly reveals the facade that they're all living in, um, in terms of where the work is coming from that allows them to live the be the way they are. So uh, I thought that's fantastic. And any other final comments on that frame? I, I oh. personally love the the framework of the foreshadowing um, of that conversation that the two characters that openly by the end mm. of the story identify as non-binary um, have this context of gender um, recognition amongst people. You know, when Lou first sees the mer people, he says mermaids, all automatically implying a gender specific idea. And when Alexis challenges that and is like, well, don't you mean more people? I was like, well, I, I guess so. I don't, I don't know. I, you know, that context of this is something I'd never thought of before and now mm -hmm. having the freedom to do so, which is why this, this literally Scott was the page that I was talking about that led into my <laughs> choice for um, that mm -hmm. conversation, because it's such a great um, setup and payoff of uh, introduction to a concept of self-explored identity um first being something that is featured as a sense of opulence uh, when they go to the to the gatsby house you walk in this big huge tunnel that's amazing and abstract no one else can really understand what that would be like to see it because we don't see that on a regular basis until through their conversation and the rest of their interaction they encapsulate that abstract and make it real for themselves unto themselves amongst themselves and it's it's super powerful because again the whole context of everything is being free to be who you want no matter how opulent it might seem it is absolutely yours to do if you just choose to take it you just anybody you want to follow up on victor All i'm right, a fan then. i'm sorry no no let me drop the mic that's what happened <laughs> right i mean <laughs> So uh, we're going to go ahead and answer the three questions that we have here. And three questions are probably going to take us about uh, 45 minutes. So we'll try not to go too long. <laughs> so question, the first one's from Hannah Yeager. Do you think it could be argued that although Gatsby has become the role model that was not available to him, it's almost frustrating that it had to be done in the first place? Mm. Mm. I can restate the question if you'd like. No, 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 no. Let me, okay. I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, All right. I owe my mother a dollar every time I say this phrase, uh, know them, they, those. And it speaks to the context of how I approach approach uh, representation as a concept. I'm not a person that aims to see people in a role for me to emulate. Um, if there is an absence of that presence, then I have to be the person that fills it. Um, there always has to be that first person. And that's what I always um, took about Gatsby, um, rep recognizing that in a sense of that whole reinvention and representation, if you're not going to see somebody in that space, if you can't see somebody in that space, rather than wave the flag and asking for it to be there, you have to become it and be that person so that you can be that representation for others to follow. And that is part of that framework, that that classic Peter Parker with great power comes great responsibility reflection of if you can identify the need for it, then you could very well fill that need as opposed to asking someone else to do so. And that is definitely what I feel um, Gatsby has done here. What comes up for me is a quote I heard Jordan Peele say once when someone was interviewing him about his movies. And, you know, I think the question was framed like, how does it feel to be the next Hitchcock? And he says, I don't answer that. I'm the next Jordan Peele. It's like, you know, and his whole mantra of follow the fun has served me well over the years where, you know, he, when he wrote the film, Nope, he was basically trying to figure out a writing exercise that was more engaging and more fun for him than turning on the TV and watching a movie. And so he said, I just followed the fun. And as long as the fun was there, I kept writing. And so I, mm. I think about that a lot as well. Mm. Writing that down right now. Follow the fun. <laughs> Follow the fun. He's a right what you survive. We've got two uh two catchphrases for the evening. Okay, we're gonna get to Aqua Baby 62's questions. First one, what events led you to making your manga book? I assume that question is for Jeremy. What um, events led you to making your book? So the clip notes. <laughs> I had a literary agent uh, many years ago that was essentially not serving me. And the whole reason I got around to reading Gatsby in the first place was because I had quit writing in, in I'd say like 2016. 
after a series of harsh criticisms from said agents that compelled me to just quit. I just didn't want to write anymore. It just wasn't fun. Um, and this person wasn't encouraging me. This person was mm. tearing me down at every opportunity. Um, and so I decided to try to read 50 books in a year. And I only got to about 34. But one of those happened to be Gatsby. Um, and around that time, I started tinkering with a completely different project. I was tired with comics because it, it can be such a grind. And, you know, it can be hard to find collaborators, fortunately. You know, I was able to find Felipe for this, but I decided to try to write a prose novel and I decided to invent a serial killer. So I very easily was able to contact the FBI, surprisingly enough. I interviewed a series of retired profilers and I was sort of off to the races with that project. And then I read Gatsby and I, again, the reinvention and the American dream felt so relevant right now that I shelved that project and I actually haven't looked at it since. And I decided to write Gatsby as a, young adult prose novel, which I did. And um, I still had that agent at the time and he tore it to shreds. And mm -hmm. uh, I decided I loved the idea so much, but I hadn't really pushed the limits as far as telling my version. I, I essentially wrote fan fiction. And so I needed to get that out of my system. And so when I decided to retool it as a graphic novel, um, I decided, I wanted to factor in all of these things that I had not had the courage to do in the original draft and using the Gatsby as a blueprint, it kept me in line and making the characters younger was a challenge because their relationships naturally had to change, especially the uh, Martel and George Wilson characters, since they're not a married couple, they're a brother and sister in this book. Um, I started hitting these sort of roadblocks. It was like, how do I get back on track to where this, these, you know, narrative milestones I need to hit. Um, but that essentially was just, you know, wanting to tell this story in a version that I wish I had seen growing up. And and it, it's been mentioned here, yet I do want to say that the way that Gatsby ends up making his money is encapsulating the American dream in a form of technology, right? Where you just reinvent yourself and you don't have to have the mounds and mounds of wealth that you've had to have to have to reinvent yourself and live it um, up until now. So sort of taking the American dream and embedding it in software is uh, kind of a brilliant stroke. And it does, it, it still is a critique of capitalism, right? It still works um, as a critique of individualism as it's lived out in the United States and again, this makes Lou just that more robust a counterpoint uh, throughout the entire story. Okay, we'll go to Aqua Baby sixty two. Wait, wait, wait! Before, before go ahead, we man. Do, um, Jeremy, I'm gonna implore, plead, beg, if you will, that you actually come out with the YA version of prose in this and have Felipe do spot illustrations. If only because as great of a story as this is, there is going to be an audience that will miss it because it's in graphic novel form. But the yeah. voice, I'm, I'm automatically assuming that the voice and authenticity of you two working together um, will be met no matter what the format is. And if you can do an adaptation of your own work, you still get to control that narrative in a great way, um, allowing other people to experience everything that you have to say including um the visual the visualization that felipe brought to this so pretty please if you don't mind doing that for me appreciate you i mean i'm already in by the way this is truly victor's wheelhouse this is exactly what he's talking about yeah yeah and i will say also just like as someone who was an english minor i've read this book a lot but and also recognizing the ways we've talked about it pre before we ended up uh, starting the webinar but like the complexity of creating adaptation and especially creating an adaptation from a written form into a graphic novel mm. and also creating an adaptation where you're not where you're in a completely different time frame you have had to change the characters how they look like their age and such and recognizing that I was picking up so many pieces thematically of what existed in the original, like one piece where, uh, like just for like an example, like cars as a like form and identifier of money. And that was showcased brilliantly with the self-driving car. 
these things that I'm like, I understand what you put down and I picked it up and really, but also recognizing as someone who has read the book and hoping that people who haven't read it were able to see and showcase that as well. But like, great commending you both with the ways that you're showing that on page with an adaptation, how difficult that is. Thank you. That was an invitation to talk about adaptation work. <laughs> I mean, just saying, just saying. Hey, that's the you can. You know, it was, yeah, it yeah. was. It was a lot of spinning plates, honestly, and and uh, at one point, I think uh, it was like two thirds of the way through, and trying to get back on track with how you know in the original text, Gatsby is blamed for the murder of of Myrtle, and it's later found out that Daisy had a hand in it, and to try to get back to that very important moment, because even though I had seen the movie reading it, it, it really did have that impact. And at one point I didn't think I could get back on track. And I, I had drafted an email that I redrafted multiple times to editorial, like saying basically like, I'm, I can't do this. Like I, 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 I can't finish it. I don't know how to finish it. And so someone pointed out to me the scene with, essentially the Dahlia character and the Myrtle character, um, Myrtle's, the Myrtle character's demise uh, happens to be in a car. And I wasn't thinking about that, you know, at the front of my brain, but someone was like, you know, in the, in the book, she dies by a car and she's sort of, she dies in a car. It's kind of the same thing. I'm like, Oh yeah. Again, I wasn't thinking about it. It's just having read that book multiple times, having seen the movie, I think some of these things just crept in. Mm-hmm. And I mean, just to kind of like push it just a little bit further, um, we have Boz Lerman as a reference point for the Great Gatsby movie. Boz Lerman also wonderfully, brilliantly directed uh, William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, recontextualizing in modern context another classic story. So using that framework, that could be you in this regard. Just I'm just throwing it out there. There you go. Push, push, push. <laughs> OK. Um... Um, Aqua Baby 62 asks also, what helped you get the courage to fully start your book? You mentioned you wrote prior for about eight years, but it sounds as none of that went published, but I bet it's just as good. Um, the rule in comics, and I know Philippe can uh, agree with this, is that you just can't quit. And for me, I realized that my goal early on, like back in 2007, was to get published specifically by a very specific publisher image comics but what i learned and it took me years to figure this out but any creative endeavor goals are important but i think what's actually way more important than having a goal is to move the goalposts. and so another goal was being a full-time writer and because i wasn't achieving that goal i was quitting constantly and so when i came across the advice from peel about following the fun i realized that me having a day job doesn't state that I'm a, a failed writer. In fact, I appreciate having a, a day job because I'm not solely dependent on my creativity to pay my bills. And so, again, moving that goalpost, I found the fun again. And it isn't about getting published. And it isn't about being recognized by a specific, specific publisher. It is about wanting to tell these stories because Felipe and I lived with these characters. Like when I write my, my narratives, like these are friends essentially that I spend all my time with. And I, if I don't care about them, no one is going to care to read about them. So, you know, it's a fun thing to do with Felipe. It's a fun thing to live in this world. And it's also bittersweet when it has to come to an end because you just won't see them again. Yeah, I agree. The, I think the finishing the book, whatever that, whatever that is, how long it has been, it's a bittersweet moment because it is an accomplishment. You finish the story, it is going out into the world, but at the same time, you were having so much fun doing it. Mm -hmm. You were familiar with those characters, you grew attached to them. And uh, it's a weird feeling. It's a very weird feeling. It, it, and it is something that is um, intrinsic to the medium because you're always working on something that takes a long time. That It, it is something that's very familiar to comics. Whatever it is that you see in the shelves took a long time to be made. 
sometimes several months, sometimes years. Mm. And that's why it is something, um, it is also a medium that people always, there's a little bit of, um, Jeremy mentioned that, uh, wanting to quit several times. I wanted to quit several times. Everyone I know wanted to quit several times. And we always come back. It's kind of this weird um, abusive relationship sort of sort of sort of sort of thing because we all love doing this. We don't want to do anything else because if you see it's not there's not a lot of money, there's not a lot of recognition, but it is what we do. It is for me especially it is something that I been doing my whole life. I don't want to be doing something else, anything else. I don't think I know how to do anything else by this time, by this point in my life. I, I think it's, it's something that I just need to keep uh, pursuing forever. And uh, I think that there, there's a quote from Jack Kirby that gets used a lot. It's something that I think he mentioned to a fan of his in a, in a, in a convention. He said uh, uh, along the lines of kid comics is going to break your heart. Mm. <laughs> it's, uh, everyone knows mm. that quote everyone who works in the in this medium wor- knows that quote and uses it whenever they are in a delicate moment in their career i used it several times because several times i felt my i, I, I found myself in a delicate situation and a, a publisher was owing me money um all sorts of stuff but we keep going we keep doing it well, no matter what and it, it's it's something very special to be do, to have done Gatsby with Jeremy because he was smooth the whole all the way through. It is something that was it wasn't painful at all. Everything worked well. The story is fantastic. The publisher was fantastic, and it's awesome to be here discussing it in so much depth as well because it it makes it what it is. It's it's it 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 it, it, it is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> I mean, on that note, I will have to give credit to Axel Alonso, who's, who's the yeah. chief creative officer at, at AWA. Um, he was the one who is the reason why this book is even in your hands because I had pitched it. My, I, I found another literary agent and she spent a year and a half trying to find it a home and no one was interested. And so he had read another book of mine um, and wanted to discuss what I was working on. And I've always been prep for these types of conversations because it's like, what else you got? And I will rattle off half a dozen ideas. And mm-hmm. one of them, I said, I really like this idea, but nobody wants it. It's about Gatsby. And he said, send it to me. And within a month, you know, we were in production. One of the reasons um, Forever we grateful. love, <clears throat> one of the reasons we love having creators on this show is because they always speak to the fact that there's work that has to be done. And for you to be able to, as you said, you live with these characters, that means you write something about them one day, you write something else about them the next day, just like we live our lives. I do something one day, I do something different the next day, maybe I do the same thing. And as I do it over and over and over and over, I know who I am, right? And just like writing characters, and you have to do that work. As a teacher, one of the things that I try to teach students is that writing is not a matter of just sitting down and dumping knowledge on a page. It's a matter of putting something on a page and then deconstructing it to see what it could become from there. But you've got to get something on the page first so you can deconstruct it. And then it's a matter of organ de- don't have to go too full mud alchemist on you, but it's construction and deconstruction, right? Over and over and over. And that's how you get to know who the people are. That's how you get to know who you are. And if you keep living like that, you get to realize you come to the understanding that you can be who you want to be, that you can be fluid because it's all about work and context. And I absolutely love it. Um, we have one final question here from Hannah Yeager. This is for Jeremy. What is this serial killer novel? Because I'm intrigued. <laughs> um, it's basically, I, um, I don't even know how to sum it up. It, I just basically created an unsub that defies all current collective knowledge of the traits of a serial killer. So having studied all of the big name ones that we all know and seeing their personality types, seeing how they were raised, seeing what they ended up committing, um, I then crafted one that breaks all of those rules to make this person literally impossible to find because there is nothing that, there's no precedent for it. 
Um, so, you know, there's murders across state lines, killing people regardless of gender, ethnicity, sex. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, but honestly, like writing a novel is very solitary and, and I've written mm -hmm. two in my life. Um, both will probably never see the light of day, but there's something about comics that I do love um, because it is solitary to write, but it's so much fun to collaborate with an artist and with Felipe, like the guy's a machine. Like, you know, there were things that I provided as reference and, and that was about it. But then he took the reference and then ran a hundred yards with it and drew things that I didn't even consider. I didn't think about. And again, it's a testament to his work because this type of story needed all of those details because I didn't, you know, there's enough imagination going on here. I don't want you thinking, well, what is, what would a tree look like in that background that was not fully rendered? Or, you know, that kind of looks like a car that I recognize, but I don't know which car or, you know, so that, that uh, hyper specific details were paramount to bring the story to life in the way that it needed to be. Fantastic. Any other uh, final thoughts, Jeremy or Felipe? Just thank you so much for the in-depth discussion here. I, I I think it's amazing that education, the educational sphere has gotten into graphic novels specifically and discussed them. And, you know, Felipe and I were just trying to tell a fun story. We didn't, I don't think either of us were expecting that anyone has put more thought into this book <laughs> than the two of us, but clearly we are wrong. No. Well, these, this is just beautiful examples of othering at multiple scales. And that's one of the reasons we use it in the class is because all perceptions are inherently otherings. In other words, you're seeing what you see in relation to everything else that's there. And graphic novels give students the opportunity to practice that. They can look at the image and see the othering. Then they can look at the thought bubbles and see the othering. And then they can talk about the culture, historical sort of otherings that are represented as well. And it, uh, yeah, so it's a fantastic way to start. Victor and I published a paper a while ago where we talked about graphic novels as pedagogical tools, um, focusing particularly on Invincible. Um, but yeah, they're here to stay. And I think people are discovering the richness uh, that's there. Um, so, hey, it's not exactly 30, but it's getting... Oh, I got to say, by the way, Felipe, please, any final comments? No, just echoing what Jeremy said. Thank you so much for for having us. This is this is an amazing experience. It's something because we work by ourselves. We work alone in a room with no one else around. And when the when the work is out into the world, people get it. People read it differently. And to get a glimpse of those different readings is something that's really special. And and it's hard to get. It. It's something that you. You need to be in a situation like this. You need to be in a, in a panel. You need to be in a specific event for this. And it's it really means a lot. It, it was really it was really it was really great. Thank you very much. Well, we're absolutely thrilled we could be part of it. Um, great work, and we truly appreciate it. So um, we want to thank the Regicon crew for being here as always and uh, bringing their wonderful questions and insights to this amazing piece of work. Uh, Faria, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, I was delighted that you picked this particular panel to join this year. Um, I didn't know you were an English minor yet. It completely shows. So I should have been able to know that, uh, yes. that is an expertise that you wield. <laughs> Alrighty then. What I want to quickly do is tell everyone what's coming up. So on um, Thursday, November 16th at 7 p.m., we'll be celebrating Native American Heritage Month with a discussion of the graphic novel Soldiers Unknown. Joining us will be author Chag Lowry and our dear friend, the indigenous indigener, Dr. Lee Francis IV. So uh, tune in for that conversation next time. Um, before we sign off, I do want to say thanks to all those people who attended and gave us questions. As you can see, we love questions. And thanks again to everyone behind the scenes making us look like we know what we're doing. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.